Assalamu alaikum and welcome to part two of Al Isra and Al Mi'raj origins. We're going to speak about Micaiah, one of another of the people. Remember, we said there are eight between eight and ten, so we're talking about the people that have ascended to heaven. In each of their stories, a little fragment have been taken and added to the story of Prophet Muhammad when they claimed he went to heaven, uh, which never happened. But anyhow, so Micaiah, Micaiah is a prophet in the Hebrew Bible who is one of the four disciples of Elijah. Elijah is Elias for us in Arabic. And uh, this prophecy talks about how Allah sets the armies against a man called Ahab. I, I'm going to mention a couple names, biblical names. We don't need to dwell on them that much because they are not important to us. But what's important is what took place generally. So Micaiah, talking to his people, he warns them. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, i.e. the revealed book that he is telling them. So people obey that book. And then he tells them. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. See the idea of the arsh that we is translated in the Quran to throne, which doesn't mean that, and I will make a talk about this, comes from these biblical texts that Allah is actually sitting on a throne. And but anyhow, and then he tells them, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of the heavens standing around him and on his right and on his left. And the Lord, here is Allah, said. So this Micaiah telling his people what Allah said. So they said, Allah said, Who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Kilaid? Again, it's, it's armies who want to fight. So Allah is telling people <laughs> who were with him there, Who will entice? Who will do that job for me? Here Allah doesn't boss people, doesn't order them to do. He seeks who can do that? Okay, and then he says, and going to his death there, i.e. you entice him and then you get and you be present when he dies. Micaiah carries on saying, one suggested this and another that, i.e. the people around Allah started suggesting names, through names. Finally, he says, Micaiah, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. But I'm not going to go finish off the story, but I will just say you can read about this story in the book of First Kings, chapter 22, verse 19, all the way to 23. You'll hear all about it and you read about all this. The third person is Isaiah, which to us is Ashaya, Ishaya. And he's not mentioned in the Quran, but is mentioned in the Bible, the Old Testament, and also part of the New Testament. So the prophet Ishaya or Ishaya tells us that the seraphim, seraphim are six winged, extremely angry, fiery angels. Those six uh, winged angels surround God as he sits upon his exalted throne and who worship God continually. They don't stop. Seraphim means just the fiery ones. In the year that King Uzziah died, Uzziah, that the Jews said he is the son of God, he's a king. But anyhow, in the year that he died, Ishaiah or Ishaiah says, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So uh, see how they depict Allah like a king with a long robe as he walks? That's what it is. Anyhow, they say above him, uh, above Allah, Al Quran says nothing is above Allah. Allah is a subhis marabbik al ala. Okay? Uh, Allah is the highest of the highest. Nobody is above him. But again, the Bible, what you want. Above him were seraphim, i.e., the fiery ones, the fiery angels, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. <laughs> wow, they want an idea. So how, how can they see on the you know? And they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. 
Woe to me, I cried. This is Isaiah, okay, Isaiah. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So this person, Isaiah, along with others, has seen Allah. Then one of the seraphims, these are the fiery angels, the angry angels, flew to me with a live code in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for, forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord of Allah saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He, Allah said, Go, and tell his this people, be the Jews, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be, be ever seeing, but not perceiving. Ajib. Make the heart of these people closed, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Then I said, For how long, Lord? And he answered, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remained in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the therbeth and oak leaf stumps, when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the lead. So read the whole story in Isaiah chapter 6 from 1 all the way to 13. Ezekiel again has been to heaven and he met with Allah and he saw things. He tells us, in my 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, actually it was 30 years, four months and five days, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, somewhere in Palestine, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. You hear this a lot in the hadith where Rasulullah saw the heavens open, especially in the Isra and Mi'raj, before him going, before going up to the heavens. The story, my dear sisters and my brothers, of Ezekiel is long, and if you wish to know more, please go and search it on the internet, and Ezekiel, or read on the internet Ezekiel from 1 all the way to 10 chapters. The Bible goes in details about these events, and it would take us for ever to study and I tell you this but enough to say that the concept and story of humans ascending life to the heavens meeting up with Allah for various reasons was widely spread back in time so the invention of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj was nothing special to Muhammad but rather a status that our sheikhs have invented to put Muhammad high above any who has ascended already. And as you have seen, it's Paul, it's John, it's Musa, it's Harun, it's Jesus, it's Ezekiel, it's Isaiah. It's, it's, it's plenty of them have gone there. Muhammad at all costs had to be the best of them all. And guess what? To us, Al-Isra wal Mi'raj, what, what, see the status of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj in our lives is what? That Rasulullah Muhammad is special to Allah. He is special, that's why he took them. He took him to the highest of places. I heard the sheikhs oftentimes say, he was taken to the highest of places because he was dear to Allah. Hey, the concept is not new. Had these sheikhs read the Bible, they would know that they were just reiterating, repeating what the Bible has said about different people. But again, it, as I said, it was common belief that to show that a prophet was close to God, then God would need that person to do certain things for him, take a human to heaven as a sign of approval. And that is a special status for that person, a reverence. All this as if Allah needed the very human he created. It's incredible. 
The story of Al Isra and Al Mi'raj resembles in great details the story of Enoch, Idris. You see, when Idris ascended to heaven, he didn't just ascend, he lived an experience. That experience was taken from Enoch, Idris, and given to Muhammad. Let me read it to you, okay? So what I'm going to read here is the journey of Idris from heaven number one all the way to heaven number ten. Yes, Allah says six heavens, uh, seventh heaven, uh, but uh, in the Bible it says ten. So here is, here is how it goes, okay? The first heaven is just above the firmament. And this is in Genesis chapter 1, 6, 7, verse 6 to 7. Where the angels control atmospheric phenomena, such as the storehouse of snow, rains, water, and everything. See, the Bible believes there is a firmament, something, as Allah says in the Quran, uh, that we have a ceiling uh, above us. The Bible says that in that firmament, just above it, the angels have everything. The water, the snow, the rain, the wind, everything is there. In the second heaven, what Idris Enoch found, he finds darkness. There is a prison where rebel angels are tortured. Any angel that has rebelled against Allah is taken to the second heaven and is tortured. Of course, for us in the first heaven, there is Adam, the second heaven, there is this and that, and you know the name of the prophet. But for Idris, it's different. But the concept is the same. In the third heaven, Idris, Enoch, he sees both paradise represented as the garden of Eden, and it is guarded by angels. And this can be read in Corinthians 2, chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse 2. And he also saw hellfire where bad men are tortured. All these are in the third heaven. The messenger of Allah saw paradise in, in number seven. And he doesn't say in which heaven he saw hellfire, but it is in one of these heavens. But for paradise, it's number seven. But uh, for the Christians, for the Bible and the Jews, it's in third heaven that uh, Enoch or Idris saw heaven and paradise. In the fourth heaven is the place of the movement of the sun and the moon, which are described in details. When you go there, it's described in details. There is also on this level a heavenly choir comprising soldier angels whose singing is wonderful and marvelous. So that's what Idris tells us. In the fifth heaven, Enoch or Idris finds some Grigori soldiers of Satan. So on the fourth one, there are angels, soldier angels. On the fifth one, he finds Grigorius. These are soldiers of Satan that look like human beings, but they are giants. And they were in state of limbo, having not yet been condemned and have not been freed. And Enoch convinced them to repent and they repented. They no longer are soldiers of Satan. All this in the fifth heaven. It's strange. It really is strange how humans have mutilated simple concepts of Allah. But anyhow, in the sixth heaven, Enoch, Idris, sees the angels in charge of governing the cosmos and people. These are the archangels. And the archangels are angels of high ranks, the high authority angels, and who are again above the regular angels. But you know, these angels measure all life and they do it in heavens and on earth. And the angels who are appointed over seasons and years, the angels who are over rivers and seas, and who are over the fruits in the earth, and the angels who are over every grass, giving food to all, to every living thing, and the angels who write all the souls of man and all their deeds and, and their lies before the Lord's face. This happens in number six. The Isra al-Mi'raj tells us that at one point when the messenger got to heaven number seven, you can go back a couple of talks, I've spoken about this in details, the messenger heard the scripting 
of the angels writing our actions. That which we, our hadith says took place in heaven number seven, in this one here, it's in number six. Because the angels are writing all the souls of man and their deeds. They write down when we die, when we do. Everything that should happen is in Christianity, have a number six. In Islam, per the hadith, number seven. But anyhow, Enoch, Idris, in the seventh heaven, now guided by Gabriel. So back in the first six heaven, he was by himself. But when he got to number seven, now Gabriel, Jibril, is guiding Idris, Enoch. And is allowed to enter and see the Lord on his throne, Billah, on seventh heaven. And our Isra and Al Mi'raj story happened on the seventh heaven, where Rasulullah went to meet up with Allah. And at one point, he turns and looks at Jibreel, and he sees Jibreel in his original form, magnificently big. And uh, the messenger Muhammad asks Jibreel, Why don't you come with me? Jibreel tells Muhammad, I can't. If I step forward, I'll be burned and killed. And that's, subhanAllah, Jibreel. Okay. And then the books of those lies tell us that Muhammad goes by himself. Hears the angels write. Sees the angels deal with destiny. Who dies, who doesn't die. Just like Idris saw on heaven number six. And then the messenger got to Sidrat al-Muntaha. To a tree, a magnificent tree. Awaits Allah. And then Allah comes. And the lights of Allah goes on the tree. And Muhammad could not but mesmerize at the tree. And that is the conversation. And there the conversation between Allah and Muhammad took place. And there Allah gave salat to Muhammad. All that is a lie. All that is a lie. Issues like this, an event like this, Allah would have said it not. You see, when Allah spoke about how Allah met with Musa, Allah, not in one, not in two, not in three, not four times, not five, not six, not seven, more than that, Allah even spoke about the argument that Musa had with his wife before going to the fire. And then when he got to the bush, Allah explained many different ways how Musa came, the conversation that took place. And an event like Rasulullah going to heaven to talk to Allah and Allah doesn't even talk about it. Is that what tells you it's a huge, huge lie? But anyway, so on the seventh heaven, Idris, Enoch, guided by Gabriel, is allowed to enter and sees Allah enter where? As I said, in the house to see Allah on his throne, face to face, but only from a distance. This is where the legends of God's angel live in beautiful light. Allah has got his own army and they live there. Then he carries on, i.e. he goes way above Allah to the eighth heaven. And they say it's just below the upper firmament. So there is a lower firmament on our world and there is the upper firmament above Allah in which are stuck the constellation. Hair, leaves, Masloth, changer of the seasons and mover of the constellation. So they live above Allah. This is of course impossible. That's why our sheikhs couldn't go beyond seventh heaven because what goes in Christianity after the seventh heaven is pure blasphemy. The ninth heaven is the upper firmament in which are fixed the constellation and changer of the season. Same thing. And the tenth and final heaven is where God's throne resides and God's face may be seen up close. Here he holds court. What it says is dangerous. Because on the seventh, you can see Allah on his throne face to face, but from a distance. But when you go on the tenth, you still see Allah on his throne. But here, you can see him very close up. And there is where Allah holds court, i.e. Uh, he rules and he judges and he holds and he does all these things. Books of history says that Enoch Idris was 365 years old when he was taken by the two angels through the ten heavens, one by one. You see, the journey can be divided into four sections. In the first section, from chapter 1 to 22, 
Enoch at the age of 365 is taken by the two angels one by one, one to ten. In section number two, from chapter 23 to 37, Enoch is guided by Gabriel, speaks with Allah in the tenth heaven face to face. After that, he is anointed, i.e. baptized by the two uh, archangels, Michael and Gabriel, and he becomes similar in appearance to the angels, i.e. Idris becomes just looking like the, the, the angels. Of course, Allah wanted to test the obedience of his angels by having them bow uh, down before Enoch. Allah ordered the angels to prostrate in front of Enoch, a group of the angels identified as the angel of Satan nail, refuses, and they were imprisoned. Just like Satan, they, they are satanic angels. And anyhow, eventually they bow before uh, Idris and uh, they addressed him a man of God. But anyhow, this story is similar to that of the war in heaven between God and Satan, or as they like to call it, between Allah and Shaitan. Uh, I can go on and the story, and it's, what I'm trying to get here is that there are tons and tons of texts from the Bible that have been translated, adapted, changed a little bit to make them appear like Islamic. Allah uh, is absolutely innocent from all this nonsense, absolutely. If you want to hear more about these biblical things, just go in a chapter of um, uh, the Bible as I mentioned them and read them. I will now mention to you a hadith that is well known, it's reported by Bukhari, by Muslim, by Ahmed. It's an authentic hadith. You've heard it many times. Where on judgment day, the, the hadith says that Allah will call upon a believer and all believers and he will tell them, Abdi, my subservient, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. And the man is going to say, Ya Allah, the person is going to say, Ya Allah, how can I feed you? And you are the Lord of the world. Then Allah answers and he says, well, didn't you know that X, Y, O, a person was hungry? And if you went to them and fed them, you would have found me with them, i.e. Uh, that would be considered as if you had fed me. Then Allah would say, Abdi, my subservient, I was sick and you didn't. Visit me. The person is going to say, Allah, how can I visit you? And you are the Lord of the universe. Allah will tell him, didn't you know that X, Y, Z was sick? And had you visited them, you would have found me like uh, with them. And now another one would the same thing about thirsty and uh, things like that. This hadith that is authentic Bukhari Muslim has got its origins in the Bible. And you can find it in Matthew chapter 25 from verse 31 to 41. Here is the text. It reads, But when the Son of Man comes in, the Son of Man is Jesus, comes in his glory, i.e. on judgment day, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. You know, the Christians, they believe that it is Jesus that will hold people accountable and that he will intercede. That's, that's why the belief in Jesus is absolutely crucial and important, at least in Catholic uh, school. But anyhow, all the nations will be gathered, and this, is, this still goes in the Bible, okay? All the nations will be gathered before him, i.e. before Jesus. And he will separate them from one another. See, according to the Christians, we Muslims will be separated because we, to them we are non-believers. But anyhow, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep, i.e. the angelic ones, the good ones, on his right, and the goats, the satanic ones, on the left. That's why usually they represent uh, the goat. When you see the goat uh, in Illuminati or the sort of things, it represents Satan. But anyhow, then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed. So this is the king, i.e. Jesus, who will talk to people all again. Jesus is the one who is going to hold people accountable. So it's Jesus talking. Then the king, i.e. Jesus, will say to those on his right, i.e. the good people, the good, come you who are blessed of my father, 
inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For, now pay attention, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. And I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous ones will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invited you in or naked and clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and came to you? The king, i.e. Jesus, will answer and say to them, Truly, I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the last of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, to the baddies, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. I was sick in a prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? When? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, i.e., you didn't take care of any of my followers, and that's why you didn't do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous ones into eternal life. The Islamic text, as I said, in Muslim and few other people, and authenticated by Albanian and everyone else, Abu Huraira reports that on the, on the judgment that the messenger of Allah said, on judgment day, Allah the Almighty would say on judgment day, son of Adam, I fell ill and you did not visit me. The person would say, my Lord, how could I visit you? And you are the Lord of the world. Allah would say, didn't you know that my subservient so and so, i.e. my worshipper so and so, fell ill and you didn't visit him? Didn't you know that had you visited him, you would have found me by him? Son of Adam, I asked you for food, but you didn't feed me. The person would say, my Lord, how could I feed you when you are the Lord of the world? Allah would say, didn't you know that my subservient, X, Y, Z, asked for food and you didn't feed them or them? Didn't you know that had you fed them, you would have found that, the reward of that, with me? Son of Adam, I asked you for water and you did not quench my thirst. He would say, my Lord, how could I give you water to drink when you are the Lord of the words? He would say, I, Allah would say, my subservient, X, Y, Z, asks you for water to drink, but you didn't give him any drink. Had you given him any drink, you would have found that with me. And this hadith, as I said, is in Muslim authentic hadith. And Al-Bukhari reported it also, not in his Sahih, but in another book, but it's authentic uh, nonetheless. And all these hadith are authenticated by Al-Albari. You can see clearly how a text from the Bible was taken, adapted, changed to fit the Islamic thing. In the Bible, it's Jesus talking. In the hadith, it is Allah speaking. These are just few examples on how concepts and foreign beliefs were introduced into Allah's religion by our religious ancestors. How the Quran was twisted to support some of these concepts. Allah never said that the messenger was taken to the seventh heaven. Not much anyone else. Even when Allah spoke about Idris, all he said is that he elevated him high.
We don't even know how that happens. What, nothing. Allah did not want to elaborate about that. And that should have stayed like that. Allah never said he took the messenger from Mecca to Jerusalem. Humans did. Humans did. I want to stop here because the story now about the, the origins of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj is in these two parts here. I want to stop and end up inshallah in the upcoming one when I will tell you about a little bit of the history about Al-Aqsa Mosque. I will stop here and start inshallah afresh on the next one about certain facts about Al-Aqsa Mosque in Palestine in the lies told to us around it and why Muslims today hold different beliefs than what reality says. I pray to Allah that these texts will help you come to terms with this big charade, big lie, big myth, big fable, big, oh, you can use whatever uh, word to express and define this idea of Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj, an event that never ever took place and that negates the whole concept that Allah gave the Salah to the Messenger in it. I pray to Allah Ta'ala to bless you all and help us all get to the bottom of this truth that is present in the Quran. All we need to do is study the Quran. This is again your brother Abdul Salam and off to the next installment. Assalamu alaikum.